So the story has always been, okay, we can't clean it up, so the best thing we can do is not make it worse. But to me, that's a very uninspiring uh, view. My name is Boyan Slat, and I'm the founder and CEO at The Ocean Cleaner. Days of sailing from civilization. You almost never come across boats or things. It's just you there alone with the plastic and just come ac across plastic so regularly. It's quite a weird experience in the middle of nowhere. The Ocean Cleanup has developed world's first feasible technology to clean up almost half the Great Pacific Garbage Patch in 10 years' time. Our goal is to develop advanced technologies to, um, to put systems in all rivers and all oceans in the world. So here we have in the water what we call the multi-level troll, which were developed by some engineers that we have at the Ocean Cleanup. And our main mission here is to better understand how floating plastics get uh, distributed in the first meters of the oceans. Because even though plastic floats, because of the waves and the wind, it pushes plastic down, particularly the tiny ones. So one of the things that we know most about of the plastic floating at sea is what we call microplastics. 803. These are tiny fragments uh, of plastics. They are smaller than five millimeter in size and they come mostly from the breakdown of um, plastic objects that get lost or discarded at sea. Um, if you see the, the trash that we've been picking up from, from the oceans. It's a nice one. They are mostly buoys and fishing crates, uh, ropes and, and things that comes from, from vessels. You want? Because of the UV light, so basically sunlight and heat, it makes the plastic brittle and it starts to break down into smaller and smaller pieces. From this mass of plastic floating at sea, how much of it is situated on debris of different sizes? So should we focus the cleanup operations on tiny plastics? Is it microplastics, mesoplastics, or mega debris? Sea Dragon, this is Pirito Radio. That's all copy, sir. And I take it your next port is Horton as well, is that correct? Uh, that is correct. Our next port will be Horta. Over. So really the goal of these two expeditions is to see how deep the plastic is. Right now, there's just, there's just still too much uncertainty. And uh, the information that we're collecting will be used to better inform the engineers currently developing the technologies to clean up the oceans. Essentially what happens is the trawl is lying flat on deck um, and we take 12 or 13 people really working all in unison to get it up off the deck and into the water. All right, big roll coming here guys. Good. Nets in. Here. Here. All right, hang on a sec for the roll to go down. I would not see my experiences that either something moves or tries to kill you or both. All right, let's go ahead and All right, let's go ahead and down and back with it. And then ease it back out so it's towing far enough aft that it tows at the right depth. How's the vertical look, Jan? Cool, you're good, bud. Alright, another hour, go get some lunch. We were doing a multi-level trawl, which is about a five and a half meter long aluminum ladder frame with 11 nets spaced down it that sits vertically in the water. We're getting uh, 11 measurements of ocean plastic concentrations, and this way we get a high resolution depth profile of plastic pollution into the garbage patch. Yep. All right, go ahead and start pulling, Bart, in case. Everybody has to work as a team or else it's going to end very badly for somebody or something. We are having this sort of 
500 pound device of uh, 15 feet long uh, sort of hovering in mid, mid air uh, on the same height as our heads are. It's quite, a, um, quite an operation, I would say. And it's actually a very uh, pioneer work. The so remote wave 1.75. We are getting the first high resolution uh, measurements of plastic into the first uh, shallow layers of the ocean. The first time I really saw any plastic pollution out at sea, um, it surprised me how powerful it was to see that. It's really hard to wrap your head around how you can be thousands of miles from land and here you go seeing a light bulb floating by, an intact light bulb, or buckets or buoys or toothbrushes or whatever it is. There's, there's an unbelievable amount of just trash floating in the oceans. The plastic is creating a, an artificial environment for a species that didn't occur here to come and uh, inhabit an area that before was mostly blue and with only a few oceanic species. That's, That's good eating right there. Oh wow. <laughs> no, mahi. There were uh, triggerfish that were swimming underneath it, and when they moved, we saw four or five dolphin fish. Quite, quite remarkable to see. We weren't very far out of Bermuda before we started seeing bits of plastic floating in the ocean, and it's frankly, it's shocking. It's disturbingly ugly in this otherwise very beautiful place. Just, it doesn't belong here. It's what you don't see as well, and as soon as you see what you can't see with your naked eye. That's even more of a punch to the gut. Here you are looking at the bluest blue of the sea. It's that endless blue. And you trawl, and in the bottom of the net, in the cod ends, here's a handful of colorful microplastic. The highest we ever got. That's crazy. That's very crazy. Man. So it was a very um, surprising for me to actually experience um, the impact that we create in such a remote area of our oceans. So it is time to act, and the quicker we act, the better. I'm going to think more carefully about what we do with plastic. I hope it will influence my children, my grandchildren, to to be more responsible about. The way they use and dispose of plastic. Because people, especially living on land where you're not surrounded by it and seeing it every day, just view it as this vast, endless sort of wasteland, and it's not. Their oceans are big, but they're not limitless, and I think people are very close to pushing those limits and stepping over the limits of what the oceans can handle.